To define Mark Martin's career in one word would be a difficult task. Some would choose stereotypical words like driver, racer, or phrases like Hall of Famer. And others might go down more of a nihilistic path. Heartbreak. Disappointment. And being immortalized as the driver who has always finished second place in key moments. But in reality, there is one characteristic that sets Mark Martin apart from the rest. One attribute that he has carried throughout every part of his career and life. Being absolutely and definitively relentless. Our story begins on January 9th, 1959, in the small town of Batesville, Arkansas. Julian and Jackie Martin would have their first son together, Mark Anthony Martin. Mark would grow up in his hometown like any other child would, except he would come to the repercussions of his father's high-energy life. Car accidents were frequent with him, along with the other occasional punishments that came with a life that was wild and free. Evidently, this caused a perpetual rift between Mark's parents. But one thing was never in doubt with Julian his love and care for his son. Whilst alcohol was always an issue in the household, Julian made sure that unlike some of the violent natures that could come fueled from that situation, it would never be put too harshly on his son. What did spill into his family's burdens was in 1971, when Julian would again be involved in a motorcycle accident that would leave him partially disabled. It was shortly after that he and Jackie would seek a divorce. What Julian did have after losing parts of his finger was a trucking business that he could work with, providing a modest life and living to his son and now separated family. Mark would find escape from the dramas of his life at one place on summer nights, the dirt track. There, Mark would watch local heroes and occasionally help them when he could. One night, near the end of 1973, scraping the dirt off of a late model, he made a decision that would change his life forever. He turned to his father and told him he wanted to be a race car driver. Reacting to the news of this, he immediately began searching for a car. They ultimately found a 1955 Chevrolet and began turning it into Martin's first car. Through family, friends, and friends of friends, they pieced it together over the off-season. Eventually, it was time to pick a number. Through personal interest, he picked two. One was available as well to Mark, but he decided against it thinking that it would be too cocky for him to run a number like that. Finally, they needed an engine for the car. They were able to claim a backup engine off a fellow local driver. And finally, it was time to race. Mark headed out for his first heat at Batesville Speedway. Mark went over the bumps in the turn one, and it sent him straight out of the racetrack. Quite literally, he flew onto the other side of the banking, as there was no walls at the track. He quickly turned it back around and pulled right back on tracks if nothing happened. After that eventful situation, Mark would ascend to quickly as the season went on. Being only 15, Mark would begin beating grown men at their own job, and anger soon arose from the locals, presenting consistent protests and arguments. Eventually, they branched out from the hometown roots to Little Rock Speedway, where again Mark showed his talent. As a 15-year-old, he faced immense aggression. Some men wanted to punish him, thinking his father had rigged up illegal equipment, and others just planned on wrecking him and harassing him. One driver even retired because he couldn't handle a fact that the 15-year-old had beaten him. Mark eventually was given a sportsmanship award for his perseverance through the insane odds of men double or triple his age. It all culminated that year with winning the Arkansas State Championship race at the Benton Speed Bowl. It became Mark's largest achievement of the season. And for 1975, they refined their car and dominated even more, reportedly winning up to 13 races in a row at the Benton Speed Bowl. It was evident for Mark's team it was time to move up out of the six-cylinder classes. They began running late models, which opened his dad to the idea that they needed as much horsepower as possible. To respond to his logic, Julian found a 496 cubic inch engine and put it in a car for his 5'4", 100-pound son. It was quickly realized that he could not physically handle this much horsepower, and they had to invest in a power steering setup something that was unheard of at the time in 1976, especially for dirt racing. They would head off to Missouri, where they would find success again. Shocking the local fans was incredible youth. 76 was also a year they started testing the paved oval scene, a running event where they would run into a man named Donnie Allison. Donnie would be stunned by the sight of the young 17-year-old with a beat-up dirt car, attempting to even race on a paved track. It was around this time 
Mark would finally set a goal for himself in his career. He wanted to win the Daytona 500. That was his lifetime achievement. For 1977, they committed to paved oval racing. They quickly learned it was induction by fire. Crashes, mechanical failures loomed over them through the early part of the year. But Mark graduated high school and was soon given a phone call by the owner of the ASA series. Unknowingly, Mark had run a handful of their events, garnering Rookie of the Year points. And since the field was somewhat thin in regards to winning that award, he was practically a lock. All he had to do was run nearly every race for the rest of the year. Being based in Arkansas, they committed and ran the primarily Midwest series across the rest of 1977. They blazed across the Midwest and drove to winning the Rookie of the Year award. And during this time, he became good friends with a fellow young driver named Rusty Wallace. The two would bond over quite a funny situation that occurred on track. Rusty would beat Mark in a race in the ASA series and was so excited that he would spin the car out in the turn one after the checkered flag and back it into the wall out of excitement. Whilst the car was destroyed after winning, Mark had a good time harassing his friend about it. With Rusty seeing victory lane and Mark winning the Rookie of the Year award, both of them were getting national attention, having articles and interviews done, and for 1978, the Martins were ready to explode on the scene. They consistently ran well throughout the year, not winning much until later in the season. What was something they were able to win though, was the 1978 ASA Championship purely by being just consistent and outlasting their opponents. With the accolade achieved, he became one of the hottest rising stars in the country. For 1979, Mark would win another ASA championship, being only 20 years old and already having back-to-back -back titles in a highly renowned series. If you thought the success would stop there, in 1980, he would be even better, winning a third consecutive championship and setting track records all across America with his highly inventive setups. It was official. After a hat trick of titles, it was finally time for them to try NASCAR. He constructed a plan, a way to attack both the Cup and Bush series, garnering the most experience he could. He would run Bush races at super speedway events, gaining experience on large tracks without the pressure of Cup, and to ensure that he would not lose Rookie of the Year eligibility, Mark would only run five Cup races, all at short tracks, the places he thought he was the best at. Through 1981, the Bush side of things went fairly well, running competitive among the field. In Cup, though, is where things got crazy. Mark, through his five races, would qualify impeccably, garnering two poles, an average starting position overall of 3.6. In races, though, was more of a different story. Mark had run ASA, but never NASCAR. Her races are much longer and much more demanding. His first race at North Wilkesboro, his car lost the gear. And at Nashville Fairgrounds, the engine would detonate on lap two. When they came back to Nashville, Mark would win the pole and then lead the opening laps. It was amazing for a young driver like that in only his third start. But then he would quickly fall back, getting lapped five times by the finish. The next race he would run would be at Richmond, where he'd finish seventh, two laps down. It'd be after stalling on the grid at the start due to a forgotten rag in the intake from inspection. Finally, at Martinsville, Mark would finish third after leading 40 laps, and proving to himself and his crew he was ready for full-time cup racing in 1982. Mark and his crew moved to Charlotte, and they set up a shop preparing for the full 1982 year. Mark would start the year with the Bush Clash, getting personal advice from Dale Earnhardt on how to win that event. He was in because of his pole win, and the car setup was far off the mark for Mark leaving him dejected about not only the Clash's performance, but the entire Speed Week's performance. In the end, he would finish 30th in his first Daytona 500. Things didn't get much better with a 26th at Richmond, and then a 14th at Bristol. Carrying the colors of Apache stoves, the O team would collect their first top 10 at Darlington finally. Apache had given Mark $50,000 in cash to start the year. Everything seemed okay thus far. His goal was the Rookie of the Year award, and he had to beat out Jeffrey Bodine driving for the Cliff Stewart number 50 car. The Pontiac team had by far much more funding than Martins, but Mark was determined, just like in his youth, that he could defeat his rivals. He had never lost so far, why would he lose now? A Bodine would put up a respectable season against him though, and although he hadn't even ran full time compared to Mark, the Rookie of the Year award only recognizes the best 17 races of the drivers competing, meaning the five missed events by Bodine became meaningless. Mark would come home 15th in points, Bodine 24th. 
and he would win Rookie of the Year over Mark. The admirable runs throughout the year with two top fives and eight top tens were quite accomplishing, but not monetary-wise. During the year, Apache Stoves went bankrupt, leaving them unable to pay, and the team was in piles of debt to various suppliers. Mark did everything he could to cover the debts and got rid of his team. He sold all the supplies, and for 1983, he had the hope somebody would hire him. That was when Jim Stacy would come calling, giving Mark an offer to drive his two car. Tim Richmond had won races in the car the previous season, and without even signing a contract, Martin said he was in. He said he didn't need one. That turned to be a mistake. The team was vastly different compared to last year. Dale Inman was the crew chief that season. He had left, though, over the offseason, and issues arose to the replacement crew chief, who had no faith in Martin's driving ability. The two butted heads occasionally, as the team continued to lose more and more money. Stacy's financial status at the time was quite poor, and even though Mark would put up some occasional good runs in the car, there was also some absolute stinkers. He would have two mechanical failures, and after those runs, they fired him. Again, not having a job, he would find a ride with DK Ulrich, running barely top 25. He then did the World 600 for Emmanuel Zervakis' team, and there he would crash. Eventually, by the end of the year, he would get hired by an upstart Morgan McClure Racing, and they would run a partial schedule throughout the rest of the year, running in the lower parts of the top 20. It wasn't great for either one of them, they didn't hate each other, but it just was miserable. They didn't call him, and he didn't call them back. At the end of the year, it was apparent nobody was actually going to call him back. And it was official. Mark was out of NASCAR. In a span of less than two years, the young man had his dreams in his hands. And now, he had nothing. It was at this time Mark would grasp the bottle and fight the demons his father fought through his childhood. The work of his lifetime resulting in drunken depression. The search began to find a new start. He quickly found a volunteer effort, looking for a driver. Originally, the team was not that serious. Mark and a friend put the majority of the work in. Mark was ready to make a return in racing. During this time, he'd meet and start dating his future wife, Arlene. With a fourth place in standings and a win at Slinger Speedway, Mark caught the attention of Jerry Guterman and his two head mechanics, Jimmy and Jeffrey Fennick. They would hire Mark in 1985, pulling him from the doldrums even more. The team was top notch and in their first season, they won five times, but came up just short of the ASA title. They set up for 1986, but they returned to cup racing as well, along with going for broke for ASA. The return to cup started in the Daytona 500, where they made the event but struggled having a very modest speed weeks. They had run another four more cup races, having respectable success for what the team was even to begin with. The overall experience being much better than what Mark originally had in 1982, it raised his spirits more. The Fennings and Mark would go on to win the 1986 ASA title as well, and Mark was officially re-establishing himself as a worthy driver for NASCAR teams. For 1987, Jimmy Fenning and Mark would separate, Jimmy taking an opportunity encouraged by Mark to take with Bobby Allison in the Cup Series. Mark decided for 1987 to take an opportunity with an ex-brother-in-law of his and run the full-time Bush season. It was a modest year with a few wins, but what it did do was get people calling them for cup rides again. Many of the smaller Ford teams began calling, as Mark had built a sturdy relationship with the manufacturer over the last few seasons. But the most prominent offer not taken by Mark was that of the 15 Bud Moore machine. One offer stood above all of them to Mark, one that he felt like he couldn't turn down. A few years prior, Mark and his career had worked on an offer of a man by the name of Jack Roush, who had built engines for Mark. Roush was now willing to go into Cup full-time and wanted Mark to be his driver. He promised Mark that no matter what, he could run two years at minimum his sponsorship would never come. And then it was settled. Mark Martin was returning to full-time Cup racing in 1988. During the season, Mark would get a gym membership, exercising even more consistently and keeping himself in shape now that he had more time to himself. Mark also started working with longtime friend Bill Davis where the two started working on a Bush Series program. 
Mark's first few races were forgettable in the number six car. Then at Bristol, they would nearly win the event. It overall was a very modest season for the upstart team, but Jack Roush voiced some displeasure. He began spreading a rumor that Mark's job was at risk at the end of the year, putting fear into the 29-year-old driver. In the end, it was just Jack ensuring to himself and to Mark that he hadn't lied down on him in his efforts. And in 1989, the results showed. They started off the year being fast, running top 10 consistently. The questions now began to be asked of when will Mark Martin win a race, instead of if he was going to get fired. Sitting third in points, the team headed to Rockingham late in the year and prepared themselves for a weekend that would change their lives forever. We are going to see the happiest man in the United States if he's able to pull this off. Bill Elliott had eight second place finishes before he won his first Winston Cup. Mark Martin has six career second place finishes, including five in 1989. The car continues to run flawlessly. Mark Martin brings it off of corner number four. There are three more laps to go. Three miles. And Jack Roush. Jack Roush and his driver, Mark Martin, will celebrate a victory here at Rockingham. This is Davey Allison coming out of corner number four. Mark Martin receives the white flag. There is one more lap to go. One more tour of the 1.017 mile oval at Rockingham, North Carolina. And Mark Martin. 30-year-old driver from Batesville, Arkansas, driver of the Strolite Ford, will win his first Winston Cup event. Here he is, moving through turns number three and four. He sees the checkered flag ahead in the hands of Harold Kinder. He receives the checkered flag. Mark Martin wins! With the win and subsequent third at Phoenix, they were second in points. A blown engine would take them down the third by the end of the year. But regardless, it was apparent that for 1990, they were going to be a threat for the championship. Daytona was again forgettable for Mark, but on a freezing cold day, they headed to Richmond, where Mark would grab his second career victory. He would go home and let the team take care of things. As he sat there, he received a phone call from the media. The question was about his penalty. Back at the track, somebody spotted a two and a half inch intake spacer on Mark's car. The tolerance was two inches. Now in spirit, what they had done was not illegal. Most teams are allowed more intake spacing by welding it onto the hood instead of the standard mounting. What Mark's team had done was the more standard way of doing it. That weekend also was one of the rare chances Bill French Jr. wasn't at the track and therefore was not there to witness the offense. When told about the situation, he deemed the penalty to be that Mark would just be put at the tail end of the lead lap. In fact, 46 points if I had a large amount of money. At first, many did not think much of the penalty besides a blow of momentum. And thus, the season went on as normal. 26th, only tanked the 16 more at Rockingham, but things would quickly turn around with a 5th at Atlanta. Back-to-back runner-up finishes at Darlington and Bristol, then a 6th, 7th, 3rd, 3rd, 4th, and 2nd. Heading into Pocono, race 13, Mark had officially grabbed the points lead. It was still early in the season, and he only had 62 points over 2nd place at the time Morgan Shepard. But the situation was becoming a reality. The sixth team was a championship threat. And with a span of the summer, Mark would hold steady atop the standings. Winning again at Michigan in August, the lead would fluctuate being above 96 at some points. The only consistent part of his battle for the championship gold was who he was battling for the said title. Dale Earnhardt was having yet another astonishing season. At the time of the Michigan race, Dale had won roughly one third of the races in 1990 but Mark was killing him with consistency week in and week out. He didn't lay up with his good runs either. The sixth team after Michigan would get third, then sixth, second, second, and third. Over those five races, an average finish of 3.2 would be accumulated. The only problem was during that time, Dale accumulated an average finish of 3.0. He had won two more times, and heading to Wilkesboro, the gap was 16 between the two in standings. Earnhardt that day would dominate, leading nearly 300 laps. It was near the end, however, that Mark would upset the Intimidator and grab his third career victory. The points lead would stay at 16 with four races left, and issues quickly arose at Charlotte, however. Mark was mediocre and grabbed 14th. Earnhardt, however, missed the opportunity on Mark and finished 25th with a pit road mishap. Mark was closing in with three races left. The gap was 49. After that, however, 
Mark would only get 11th, and Earnhardt would claim 10th. The gap was 45. Two races left, and Phoenix was next on the calendar. Mark would head in and finish top 10. Another decent run. The only issue? Earnhardt would break the track record and lead the most laps in a race ever there, winning. Mark was now underwater by six points. They would head into the last race with an off week. They tested at Atlanta alongside the Robert Yates 2018. There, the six team was relatively fast, but they weren't holding blazing speeds. Mark would turn a lap in Davy's car later in the session that was two tenths quicker than his own. They then agreed to swap cars. It'd bring them a sixth place finish by end. A good run. The only issue, Dale finished third. And with that, his fourth title. Mark would lose by 26 points. 20 shy of what his penalty was in the spring. The punishment that inevitably lost him the title. Controversy ran rampant postseason and even up to today. Claims that NASCAR didn't want a northern owner and Jack Roush winning the championship sprouted up. Although Mark himself, out of the ridiculousness of those claims, cited, how would NASCAR even know in race two that they were going to be championship contenders? Whatever it is, or whatever it was, it's over. And they were second, heading into 1991. The 1991 season was solid for Mark, still showing that front-running speed. It was, however, a step off to what they were in 1990. Still, they were sixth overall in points by season's end, but they went winless all the way till the finale race at Atlanta. That day in November would be the lone race win for Mark in that season, dominating the day and grabbing momentum heading into 1992. Before 92, the first win would come early at Martinsville, but then inconsistency and poor runs plagued the races beforehand. He wouldn't break the top five in points all the way till race 16 at Pocono. He would ride fifth in standings all the way to Fall Charlotte, where he would claim victory again, but afterwards would go on to finish 30th the following week. Although in 1992, Mark was a part of the signature six drivers vying for the mythical 1992 championship, he was the furthest back at 113. He would have needed a lot to go his way in order to win that championship, and that would be before a 32nd place finish that afternoon. 1993 would start off much better than the previous seasons for Mark. A sixth, fifth, seventh, but then inconsistency. By race 10, they had three finishes already outside the top 30. And they cobbled together a streak of decent runs over June to early July. But then they headed to Watkins Glen. And that was when things changed. Headed for turn number six, where we have seen many crashes today, including one early in the race involving Rick Mass, but we've had no driver injuries. He's off of corner number six, now headed for turn seven. He enters it, comes on to the straightaway, sees the checkered flag, it's waving for him, he wins it. Mark Martin has the flag. All right, Mark Martin is coming off turn four as we watch these guys go in turn three. And here Mark Martin, here he comes. He wins his ninth career NASCAR Winston Cup race in his 222nd. There it is. Rusty, Rusty on the outside. to go to the outside in turn one, but Mark blocks the way. Now Rusty will look high off of turn two. They've got a half a lap to go. Wallace tries to make a move to the inside. He's going to make it to the outside. No, he can't do it there. It's going to be Mark Martin winning the Bud 500 over Rusty. Mark Martin, this will be his 11th career NASCAR Winston Cup win. It'll be his fourth of this year. It's his first win ever at this grand old racetrack that has been hosting a NASCAR Winston Cup race on Labor Day weekend since 1950. And Earnhardt took the white flag, so he will be credited with four spot, even though the car shouldn't get back, but it will get back, and Mark Martin wins. Mark Martin's express continues. He has won four in a row. Mark Martin continues to eat into the points lead of Dale Earnhardt for the 1993 NASCAR Winston Cup Championship. A great win. They won four races in a row, but regardless of how many wins he had, he was still far out of the championship hunt. And after a fifth win at Phoenix, setting up to that point his career best win total in a year, he was no shot to win over Dale Earnhardt for the 1993 championship. For 1994, they were priming to make it their year. It would be the second time Mark would finish second in standings. And again, it was to Earnhardt. This one, however, was not nearly as bitter as what the previous 1990 battle was. Mark was over 400 points out of this championship fight. And for the majority of the year, was actually third behind Ernie Irvin and Dale Earnhardt, the two people actually viewed to be fighting for the championship. After Irvin's injury, though, at Michigan, 
and would end up finishing second to Earnhardt, who would claim that year his seventh championship. For 1995, things looked great for Mark. He had nine top tens in the first ten races, and then he won at Talladega. But then, once again, that horrid inconsistency. A poor run at Charlotte and Dover tanked his championship opportunity. He would win for the third year in a row at Martinsville, but follow the run-up with a 38th. Later on in the season, he would win back-to-back, -back, eventually coming home fourth in standings. Mark and his Vavilene team were doing great. Every year, they were a championship threat. A vast contrast to the surprise they were in 1990, driving that red Folgers car. But in 96, things changed. It'd be a year that they would want to forget. Mark went winless for the first time since 1988, a crushing blow to the team who had overall 23 top 10s and 14 top 5s, grabbing 5th in points as well. Now that sounds like a great season, but for Mark, who was a short track driver, and winning meaning everything to him, the fact that he had no visits to victory lane was a sign for things to change. They decided to take longtime stalwart Steve Hamill off of Mark's pit box, and they replaced him with a familiar face. Jimmy Fenning. The Fenning era started off with a slow go. Not many great runs, but finally by Sonoma, Mark would pull off his first victory together. And then soon after, they would win another race at Talladega. At that race, Mark would set the fastest 500 mile race ever in NASCAR history. One that still stands today, and more than likely will never be broken. The streak was a relief to Mark, who after the slump, had fully believed that he would never win a race in his career again. The run led to four more consecutive top fives, taking Martin all the way to second in points. He would grab another one at Martinsville, the worst fourth of the year Dover, and ending off the year third in points and ready for 1998. They started off that year rough points-wise, 38th at Daytona, but then a third, and at the new Las Vegas, he would win. The earliest since the year since 1990, Martin would claim a victory. After that, it was a 25th at Atlanta, or two sevenths, then another one at Texas. Two runs of 29th and 23rd were massive blemishes on Martin's season, but then another one at Fontana, leading up with a fourth, seventh, fifth, and another one. After that, it was a fifth, sixth, and then three second place finishes in a row. Heading into Watkins Glen, Mark had spent some time with his father again. Over the last few years, their relationship had strengthened considerably. The two had actually distanced themselves from one another after Julian had taken a spin way off the deep end due to various life events happening. When Julian made it a goal in 1985 to get his life back on track, him and his son reconnected, and Julian actually started another family and got married. It was living the best life he had up to that point, and he even became a pilot and took advantage of Mark's house being practically on a private runway as well. The night before Mark left for Watkins Glen, they talked, and the last thing Julian said to Mark was that he loved him. He got on his plane, and they took off to head back over to Nevada. August 8th, 1998. Over the Nevada desert, Julian and his new family would be flying until suddenly the plane would have an issue. The cabin depressurized, and it caused all members on board to faint. The plane unpiloted would soon crash into Nevada sand. When searchers got to the plane, they discovered that there was no survivors. After Mark finished what would be his fourth second place run, he was told of the news. Mark was devastated, along with the family. And over the next week, services were held. Mark had one job for the following weekend. It was to win Michigan. In the race, he would get the lead late and be determined to win for his family. But with around nine to go, the car would fade and he'd be passed by Jeff Gordon. Martin would actually fall to fourth by the end, and it would become one of, if not the biggest loss of Mark's career. It was devastating, disheartening, but he didn't give up. He still wanted the win for his family. He has won at Vegas, Texas, California, and Michigan. All of those, of course, those are super speedways about to chalk up a short track victory. Mark Martin wins the Goodies Head Encounter 500 at Bristol Motor Speedway. His fifth win of 1998, his 27th career win and sixth on a short track. Absolutely a fan favorite. He climbs out of the car and will climb down on the side of the Babylon Ford. Mark, you stood up there, 140,000 people cheering. Before we talk about the race tonight, I want to talk about the week. 
A week ago, you drove your heart out. You wanted it in the worst way. You said you were going to go home and come back and kick tail. You did tonight. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, I'm pretty out of breath here. I want to thank the race fans. Their sympathy and support, love, and uh, love for their sport and love for our family has meant everything. I cry cried last week because... I didn't get to dedicate a win to my dad and Shelly and Sarah. This one's for them. And uh, he'd have been proud of this one tonight. Uh, it's an awful good, uh, awful good run. And I want to thank this race team, Babylon Cummins, Bugle Bosch, Ford Taurus, and Goodyear for their support. Now, I don't know if we're in the running for this championship or not. But I tell you what, we got the best race team on the circuit, whether we win it or not. And I'm proud. I'm proud to be with him. Although Mark would go on to finish second in standings at season end, he picked up a career-high seven race wins. And with Jeff Gordon that year's champion grabbing a staggering 13 wins, the two of them grabbed 20 of the 33 races. And Mark would get his first win in the Winston that year as well. For 1999, it would be the first season for Mark in his 40s. He grabbed another two wins that year and ran third in standings again. He had finished behind Dale Jarrett and Bobby Labonte. For 2000, Mark would claim a lone win and fall to 8th in standings for the season. But the 16 wasn't prepared for the turmoil of 2001. That year, they went winless yet again, and collected an average finish of 18th. It was brutal for Mark. Only three top fives coming in Talladega, Charlotte, and Pocono. And the team was far off of their triumphs from less than five years ago. Mark again was having the thoughts of, will he ever win again? And heading into 2002 at 43 years old, and the feeling of the pressure of the new sponsor Pfizer coming in that had signed in 2001 expecting success had unfortunately been disappointed. It was at this time that Rouse decided to swap crew chiefs again. They put Jimmy Fenning on Kurt Busch and Ben Leslie on Mark Martin. Leslie and the team worked hard to turn Mark around and for the Coke 600 that season, it paid off. Mark would soon be in a battle with Sterling Marlin for the championship lead that year, grabbing it at Loudon from the 40 team. After a second place at Dover the following week, Mark seemed to finally be behind the steering wheel of a championship battle. Heading to Kansas, he had a 30-point lead. And knowing this, he told Jack Roush to be conservative with the engines. Knowing if they took the mechanical failure out of the equation, Mark could easily win this championship. However, the engine would let go at Kansas, and the mechanical woe was followed in the Talladega, where the infamous pre-race accident occurred. His steering wheel would lock under caution while warming his tires, causing him to veer in the championship competitor Jimmy Johnson. They needed to caution the rebound, and ironically, that would be the last time NASCAR would have a race go green flag to flag, never getting a single yellow. After that, it was pretty much over. Second in points for the fourth time in his career. It didn't help that in 2003, he would have a disaster season. And again, at the end of the year, Roush wanted to reinvent the sixth team. They employed Pat Trison onto the six car, and they shuffled pit crew members again. 2004 was somewhat of a rebound. Mark would make the chase and grab a lone win at Dover in the spring. However, it would be somewhat underwhelming. Catching wind of good buddy and former ASA pal Rusty Wallace wishing to retire at the end of 2005, Mark also made the announcement that for 2005, it'd be his last full-time season in the six car. He started off the year as if he was retiring celebrating his wonderful career. Mark would not make a promise of not racing in NASCAR in 2006 though. Instead, he began setting up a program to race in the truck series that year. The schedule he thought was perfect. It wasn't too long, it wasn't demanding, a series he never really raced much of. He built his entire team, handpicked, and was ready to have a blast. That was until Jack Roush called him. He asked him for a favor. The favor being, he wanted him back in the six car for 2006. Roush Racing at the time did not have a driver prepared enough to take over the six car. And through business jargoning and begrudgingly making the decision, Mark returned for yet another full-time season. He had a solid year, making the chase, but didn't really care. He was sick of the full-time grind, the perpetual shine of the limelight. And on top of all that, his full-time truck season was put to a stop allowed to only run 14 races, and still claiming six victories during those. He missed nearly half of the year and still finished top 20 in truck points. He also returned to Xfinity racing for the first time, 
after retiring from it in 2000. It was all because he just wanted to run for fun. He was at the time the most winningest driver in the Xfinity Series. And before in the 90s when he ran the Bush Series, he would own his own team practically. Mark didn't know what to do for 2007. Roush gave him only one option, run full-time in the sixth yet again. Instead, Mark got a phone call from MVV Motorsports manager Jay Fry. He asked Mark what he was doing for the following season, and he told him his situation. That was when Fry told him about Bobby Ginn, a real estate mogul, investing in the team heavily. They wanted Mark to drive on a part-time deal. He could pick his races, what he wanted to do, and all that Mark had to do was just show up. It was set. For 2007, Mark would run the 01 Army car. Flag, one lap to go. Front four, single foul. Here they go. They got to go. They got to get Mark moving. They got to move him somehow. He gets back to that yellow line right around the bottom, all the way through turn one and two. Mark Martin is driving the race of his life. And there's nobody that's better. And, and holding people off at Daytona. And Kyle Busch lagged back a little bit. Is he going to get help? Is he going to come? There's He's looking. Back behind you. Almost. He almost squeezed Harvick into the wall. And here comes Harvick, the 29, with Matt Kenseth. Oh, Mark got loose. Mark got loose. And Harvick's getting a run off turn four. It's going to be a drag race all the way back to the start-finish line. No caution. They're side by side. Right to the line. Big crash. Here they come. Checker flag. This is perhaps the most devastating loss in Mark Martin's career. This was his childhood dream. What he sat thinking about winning when he was scraping the mud off of those people's dirt cars in the dingy Arkansas dirt track scene. He thought he had played it perfect. He had let Harvick get to that run on the outside, thinking the five of Kyle Busch, one of the fastest cars would be there to push him back ahead by the start finish line. Instead, that car got wrecked. All of them got wrecked. And he thought for sure a caution would come out before he would cross the line. But they let him race back, and the side draft dance worked in Harvick's favor. People question why Mark that year did not want to run full time after his impressive start. He was the points leader when he would miss his first race, and the reason behind this was because the title didn't matter to him. It never really mattered to Mark. Sure, did he pursue it? Of course, why wouldn't you? But just like many of those short track racers from the Midwest and South, would it be great to win a title? Without a doubt. But a 10-win season? That is what puts you on that prestigious list. For example, a championship has to be handed out every year. But a 10-win season? That has happened only three times in the last 25 years as we sit right now. Mark Rand competitive part-time. But behind the scenes, the team was falling apart. Bobby Ginn didn't have the money that he thought he did. And things got so bad that Jay Fry had to payroll a week's worth of money to people out of his own pocket. On top of that, the team would get purchased by DEI eventually. And the second year of his two-year contract was up in the air, even more. Through shuffling, Mark got the 8 car for 2008. On a couple occasions, he almost won a race in this disaster fest of a team. But he could see the writing on the wall for 2009. He was not going to be able to continue his part-time shenanigans here. And 2009 was much in question. That was when he was called by Rick Hendrick. He wanted to know if Mark would go back full-time racing in 2009 to drive his five car. He at first denied Hendrick, not interested in a full-time schedule. But he then realized Rick is giving him one hell of an opportunity to drive in his pristine car. Mark, against his wife's wishes, agreed to a one-year full-time offer with the plan of being running part-time 2010 and 2011. At 50 years old, Mark Martin was back full-time racing. And it started off a little rough. He started on the front row at Daytona, but didn't do much with it. Back-to-back -back engine failures in the 31st at Atlanta sunk him all the way down to being almost outside the top 36 in points. They soon started snapping off some runs for getting to Phoenix, where Mark would do something monumental. Ryan Newman. In front for the first time tonight, green flag.
Mark Martin looked to the inside. He's going to go to the high side, though, through one and two. This will be no contest. Look at how he goes off turn two. He yanks Tony Stewart by five car lengths. New team, new driver. One White more. flag in the air. Nice and smooth. Nice and smooth. One more. Like Mark needs to be told, nice and smooth. He's got a one second lead. He's got half a lap to go. I'm going to tell you what, this is going to be a popular win with the fans and with the competitors. I guarantee you that. And I'm really happy for Rick Hendrick because this five car, it's been a while since it won a race, and Rick really is proud of this opportunity way that uh, got to send it. Mark Hamm, good job, Mark. I knew I, I had to go. I, you know, I went one way and then. And then that didn't work, so then I went the other and uh, it made it work. But we had the car. Thanks, guys. And Mark Martin getting hugs and high fives from his former boss and old teammates from Roush Racing. Mike, what a special victory lane. Tony Stewart on the way in to congratulate the old man. Mark Martin at age 50 wins for the first time in 98 starts. <laughs> this started the run, Mark states, as being the best season of his career. At 50 years old, he won the Southern 500, claimed his first win on fuel mileage, and then knocked off another one at Chicago. Mark would make the chase with vigor and pop off a win at the first race at Loudoun. However, he would come up short to Jimmy Johnson, his teammate, who was in the best run of his career as well. For the fifth time, Mark came up short again. But in reality, who really cares if he came up short? He put up the best season by a driver, hell, by an athlete in sports, past the age of 50, ever. Who has performed at arguably their best 30 years past their debut? Racing people who weren't even 10 when you started your top level career. 2010 and 2011 for Mark and Hendrick were bland. They shuffled the teams and it hurt the five car chemistry. After three years of Hendrick, He's ready to go part-time again in 2012. That was when Michael Waltrip contacted him, seeing if he was open to a part-time deal race in the 55. He said yes, and Mark became the oldest pole winner ever, and nearly won various races. Rodney Childers was his crew chief at the time, and they are building something amazing during that year. For 2013, Mark came back at 54 years old, and he came home third in the Daytona 500, and they led 75 laps at Phoenix. But it was at this point that he finally appeared to have lost a step. Mark was off his game a little when Brian Vickers won in the same car at Loudoun. He knew at this point his time was up. And he told Waltrip that he was done after 2013. When Tony Stewart got hurt that year, he decided as one last favor to run the 14 and let him finish out the year in that car. His last top 10 will be a ninth at Richmond that fall. And he would end the year with a 19th at Homestead. With that, Mark ended his career with 882 starts. During those, he grabbed 40 wins and a monumental 271 top fives. That puts him in the top 10 all time in top fives. Being close to drivers like Dale Earnhardt and beating other drivers like Cale Yarborough out in all time top fives. And perhaps his least mentioned accomplishment and probably in my opinion his greatest is his 453 top 10 finishes, which at the time of his retirement, only one other driver had that many, Richard Petty. It is said time and time again that Mark Martin is the greatest driver to never win a cup title. Whether a compliment or an insult, it was never his goal. His dreams always lied in victory line. And to the fans, I appreciate every one of you, the passion and the inspiration that you've given me. I always try to live up to that inspiration and represent you on and off the track in a worthy manner, worthy of your respect. So for every person that ever worked on any of our teams, I salute you. This is your moment, our moment. The road was long and sometimes the mountains seemed insurmountable, but in the end, here we stand in the grandest victory lane of all. We made it to the NASCAR Hall of Fame.